إن الحمد لله نحمده ونستعينه ونستهديه ونستغفره ونعوذ بالله من شرور أنفسنا ومن سيئات أعمالنا من يهدي الله فلا مضل له ومن يضلل فلا هادي له أشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له شهادة عبده وابن عبده وابن أمته ومن لا غنى به طرفة عين عن رحمته وأصلي وأسلم على خير هاد محمد بن عبد الله صلى الله عليه وسلم بلغ الرسالة وأدى الأمانة ونصح الأمة فكشف الله به الغمة وجاهد في الله حق جهاده حتى أتاه اليقين يا أيها الذين آمنوا اتقوا الله حق تقاته ولا تموتن إلا وأنتم مسلمون يا أيها الناس اتقوا ربكم الذي خلقكم من نفس واحدة وخلق منها زوجها وبث منهما رجالا كثيرا ونساء واتقوا الله الذي تساءلون به والأرحام إن الله كان عليكم رقيبا يا أيها الذين آمنوا اتقوا الله وقولوا قولا سديدا يصلح لكم أعمالكم ويغفر لكم ذنوبكم ومن يطع الله ورسوله فقد فاز فوزا عظيما أما بعد فإن أصدق الحديث كلام الله وخير الهدي هدي محمد صلى الله عليه وسلم وشر الأمور محدثاتها وكل محدثة بدعة وكل بدعة ضلالة وكل ضلالة في النار عباد الله أوصي نفسي وإياكم بتقوى الله وأن نقدم لأنفسنا أعمالا تبيض وجوهنا يوم نلقى الله يوم لا ينفع مال ولا بنون إلا من أتى الله بقلب سليم يوم الحاقة يوم الصاخة يوم الطامة يوم ترونها تذهل كل مرضعة عما أرضعت وتضع كل ذات حمل حملها وترى الناس سكارى وما هم بسكارى ولكن عذاب الله شديد All praises be to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the king of the world, the master of the day of judgment. I bear witness no one is worthy of worship but him subhanahu wa ta'ala. And I bear witness that his messenger Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is the final and the greatest messenger and the seal of the prophets was sent to mankind to bring them out of the darknesses of this world to the light of this world and the hereafter and from the injustices of religions to the justice of Islam. قال تعالى إن الدين عند الله الإسلام وقال تعالى ومن يبتغي غير الإسلام دينا فلن يقبل منه وهو في الآخرة من الخاسرين I remind myself before you to fear Allah and that we begin to do actions which will brighten our faces on the day we meet Allah on a day he describes it سبحانه وتعالى where wealth and children will not benefit except he who comes to Allah with a pure heart أحبتي في الله As I look in this masjid and across this room I see a lot of youth MashaAllah And I see different ages And I see different ethnicities and races But one thing I am confident in Is that many of us in here, if not all of us Are what I like to term first generation Muslims <coughs> Not from the standpoint of our ancestors were on a different deen. But rather, I am confident that most of us in this masjid are the first generation in a long line of ancestors and a long lineage that is attempting to make Islam the focal point of their life and is attempting to make the deen dictate how they live their life and how their children are raised. And from that standpoint, I call us first-generation Muslims. Because I'm sure if you start thinking back to your childhood, you weren't being dragged every couple of days to the masjid to listen to lectures. You weren't being dragged on the weekend to attend majalis al-ilm and circles of knowledge. And perhaps your parents weren't afforded that opportunity from their parents and so on and so forth. 
And here we are today in 2022. And most of us, Fadlillah Azza wa Jal, we want and we recognize how important making Islam the center point of our life is. But for some reason, the results are not there. And for some reason, we are having and seeing an influx and an increase of atheism in our children. We are seeing more and more of our children being lost. We are seeing more and more people deviating from the path of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, even though a good number of us are trying our best. So clearly whatever formula we've been using needs some adjustments and needs to be fixed. And we as Muslims, as smart as we are in comparison to the rest of the world, we're not smart enough to figure this out on our own. And we need guidance and we need a blueprint. And the best time in terms of a parallel that, simp that simply is exactly the way we are today, in terms of the circumstances that I could think of, is when Islam was first sent down to the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And there are a few similarities between their time and our time that are identical. Perhaps for different reasons, but the circumstances are the same. And that first one is the fact we are so weak in earth today. The Muslim Ummah is so weak and so defeated to the point where nations who worship cows are stepping on us and burning our people alive. To the point where nations that don't even believe in a God are humiliating us. And when you look at Islam in its inception, when it was first revealed, the Muslims were so weak they had to practice in pride. They couldn't come out and even say they were Muslim. And once again, for different reasons. They were few in numbers, right? Today we stand over a billion and we're still so weak. But the weakness on earth is the same. And another identical similarity is the society we are living in is the same type of society Islam was revealed to. A society that's indulged in the shahawat, indulged in the fitan, indulged in all types of sins. Our society today, hadith wa la haraj, and I don't need to go into details, but it is no different than the society Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was tasked to change. The alcohol was rampant and the zina was rampant and the stealing was rampant to the point they used to kill their infant daughters. A society that was extremely corrupt, similar to ours today. And they wanted to make Islam the focal point of their lives the same way the beginning of my khutbah addressed we're attempting to do the same. So, although our boats are not identical, they're similar enough to draw comparisons and to learn from. And then you ask the question, how is it and why is it that they, with handful of Muslims at the beginning, were able to become the most powerful nation on earth even though their circumstances resembled ours and today we are regressing and we are just getting deeper and deeper into this issue. What happened? What was so different? And that's an important question and it needs to be addressed every single day in our minds, to ourselves, to our families and our communities. Why is it that we have more wealth and we have more numbers and we have more influence and more outreach and, and, and... But we just keep getting worse and worse on earth and they were able to elevate themselves to the point where the Persian empires and the Roman empires did not dare mess with them. What happened? And there's many different things we can discuss. But the number one thing from my studies and in my opinion is their focus on an iman that we have neglected is their focus and how determined and conscious they were of instilling al iman in the muslims hearts 
And by them I mean the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and the Sahaba. This is the major difference between them and us. Il Iman has yet to penetrate our hearts. And if you think Islam or being Muslim automatically means you are mu'min and automatically means the Iman is in the heart, you are mistaken. They come to the Messenger والسلام, they say, We have believed. We are mu'mineen. We are believers. So Allah orders him, Tell them, Do not call yourself believers yet. Just call yourself Muslim. Once the Iman penetrates your hearts, then you will be classified as a believer. <coughs> Il Iman, my beloved brothers and sisters in Islam, for 13 years in the Mecca period was all the Messenger والسلام, was focusing on. 13 years. Iman, Iman, Iman. And when you start thinking about it, when was Ramadan prescribed? After Al Hijrah. When was Al Jihad prescribed? After Al Hijrah. When was Zakah prescribed? After Al Hijrah. When was the Salah, the thing that if you leave it and neglect it, you are no longer a Muslim? When was it prescribed? A year or so before Al Hijrah, 12 years into Al Islam. <clears throat> Why? Because to expect a society and a people to change without an Iman being the foundation in their hearts is a losing effort. You have to make them believe in the change, not just try to get them to change for the sake of changing. And this is what we're miscalculating today. We're trying to raise our children and our communities in do and don't without instilling the foundation of Al-Iman. Jundub bin Abdullah al-Bajali radiyallahu an kana yaqul ta'allamna al-Iman qabla al-Qur'an fazdadna bihi imanan wa kana Abdullah bin Umar radiyallahu anhuma yudannan hawla dhalik fa yaqul تعلمنا الإيمان قبل القرآن ثم يأتي أقوام يتعلمون القرآن قبل الإيمان فيحفظون حروفه ولا يحفظون حدوده. These two companions they used to say and they were from the younger companions they used to say when we were younger we were taught الإيمان before the Quran because what good is memorizing the Quran if you're not implementing it. What good is memorizing the Qur'an if you don't even understand what it's trying to get from you? It's like the one of us who fasts Ramadan and it's coming up, may Allah give us life, as the one of us who fasts Ramadan and gets no benefit out of it, just leaves the food and the drink. So Abdullah bin Umar, he used to say, we used to learn and be taught in Iman before the Qur'an. But there will come people after us, speaking about perhaps our generation, who will learn the Qur'an before the Iman. And they will and pay attention to this and will memorize its letters, but not memorize its limits. That sound familiar, my brothers and sisters? This is time and this is a wake-up call for us to realize our formula needs recalibration. We need to adjust this formula. When the foundation is proper and it's solidified in the hearts of the believers, you ask them to go die for the sake of Allah, they will have no hesitation. Today we're struggling to convince our young brothers and sisters to pray. We're struggling with our families if this is halal or wajib or haram. We're struggling with, fit, with fatawa that have been discussed by the scholars of Islam for hundreds of years. And then we expect to actually be powerful on earth. Allah will not give power to people like that. You know, I'm sure we've all had this conversation before about the end of times, right? And we've all gotten to that point where we talk about Al-Mahdi and when he comes and he will lead an army. Brothers, I hate to be the bearer of bad news, but do you think Al-Mahdi will want to fight with people who don't even pray? 
Do you think Al Mahdi will take to his army people who are struggling with the most clear orders in the Quran and in the deen? Do you think Al Mahdi wants people who memorize the Quran or implement the Quran? We need to teach our children in Iman before we start worrying about the do's and the don'ts. This is what's getting our youth into trouble. They live 18 years under your roof, this is halal and this is haram and you don't explain anything else. Then the second they're out of your jurisdiction, they're out of your huh, supervision, that's it, they're gone. The only reason they were doing and not doing is because you were watching. We need to reintroduce death to our families. We need to reintroduce al-akhirah to our families. We need to reintroduce this idea of standing before Allah to our families. We need to get the iman in their hearts. Then even if you are gone and when you're gone, you will be comfortable and confident your kids will hold on to the deen. Al-iman, my brothers and sisters in Islam, is what will propel action is what will motivate you and encourage you and light that fire for you to actually act. Do you think you will have trouble praying five times a day when your Iman in Allah is solidified? Do you think you will have trouble dealing with the fitan when your Iman is strong? When we look back at the Sahaba, when we look back at the Prophets, at the Messengers, we see what true Iman, what type of action it leads to. And you all know the story of Ibrahim alayhi salam and his son. He tells Ismail, I've seen in my dream that I am slaughtering you. Allah has ordered me in my dream to take your huh, head to slaughter you. Ismail alayhi salam without hesitation, he says, my father, do what you're being instructed to do. I will be patient. Do you know the level of Iman? in Ismail's heart for him to have that reaction. Today, if our children are on their phone and we just ask them for anything, they'll get upset, right? It's not because they're bad kids. It's because we did not put the Iman in their hearts. We did not instill the Iman in their hearts. That's why prayer is considered a chore for so many Muslims. We have no idea why we're praying. We just consider it a chore. Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, what he used to say to Bilal, when he had all the stresses of the world on his shoulders sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, what he used to say to Bilal? Arihna biha ya Bilal. Oh Bilal, go make the adhan so we can finally have some comfort in this life. The salah was a source of comfort for them. For us it's a chore. The salah is the same. The number of prayers hasn't changed. The number of rak'ah hasn't changed. What we read hasn't changed. So why is it so difficult for us? The missing ingredient and the main difference between them and us is al iman. One time the messenger alayhi salatu was salam was with the sahaba to show you what iman will lead to was with the Sahaba and two men come to complain. They have an issue between them. So they come and they tell the Messenger alayhi salatu wasalam that one of them, the two men, one of the, the first man, he owns a palm tree. And the second man could really use this palm tree because it's close to his garden and he can build a perimeter, he can build a fence. And he wanted to buy it. So the first man refused. So when they tell the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he tells the first man, give it to him and I promise you a palm tree in heaven. If you have a palm tree in heaven, you know you have access to it. And the man refused. The man refused. It's his right to refuse. So in the Sahaba or in the group of Sahaba was a Sahabi by the name of Abu Dahda. And he heard. So he went to the first man. And Abu Dahda was known for having one of the most beautiful gardens. So he tells this first man, would you trade me your palm tree for my garden? So he looked at him and he said, are you crazy? 
an entire garden for one palm tree. So he said, I'm not crazy. Would you do it? The man agreed. So Abu Dahdah then runs back to the Messenger وسلم, and he says, if I can get that palm tree, do I have the same offer? He says, of course. So he gives him the palm tree figuratively. He tells him, this is for you. So then the Messenger وسلم, keeps repeating how many palm trees in heaven for Abu Dahdah. How many palm trees in heaven for Abu Dahdah? It's not over. He has to go home now. He has to get his family out of the garden. So he yells to his wife as he's gathering his belongings, I have sold the garden. This is their home. So she says, what did you sell it for? What did you get in return? He says, a tree in heaven. What's her response? Rabiha al-bay'i ya Abu Dahdah. Oh Abu Dahdah, what a great business deal you made. And she packed her stuff and they left. Do you know the type of Iman in Abu Dahdah's heart to make this deal? Do you know the type of Iman in his wife's heart to accept and actually be happy with this deal? Compare that to us brothers. And this is not to discourage anyone that I'm expecting myself or you to reach that level of Iman. We will never reach that level. Abu Bakr in one hadith, the Prophet wasallam, he saw in a dream where the scale had two sides and Abu Bakr's Iman was placed in one side and the rest of the ummah was placed in the other and Abu Bakr was heavier. This is not to discourage us that if we're not doing these things, we won't have true Iman, no. But in the, when the discrepancy and the gap is so big and so severe to the point where today we have women, Muslim women who encourage their husbands to do the haram so they can have more purses, so they can have more whatever the trend is now, alligator leather bags. Right? We have Muslim men today who are willing to neglect their entire prayers so their boss doesn't ask them where did you go or what were you doing. We have our youth today who will miss their entire salawat and wait until they get home just so someone in the street or in the library or at school might not think they're weird. When our Iman is leading to this and their Iman is leading to that, then we need to, huh? we need to bridge the gap. And when we bridge the gap, you will see yourself a whole different Muslim. You know why? Because you will be considered a believer at that point. Only when the Iman penetrates the heart. الحمد لله الحمد لله الذي هدانا لهذا وما كنا لنهتدي لولا ان هدانا الله Since we mentioned Abu Bakr we'll finish with one story or maybe two about him رضي الله عنه وارضاه And we're still on the topic of الايمان is what propels the person into action and when you understand that formula, you realize the action before an Iman, as nice as it looks, is deficient. Right? Fasting the month of Ramadan, which is coming up, without an Iman for benefiting in the month of Ramadan is deficient. To the point he sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, مَنْ لَمْ يَدْعَ قَوْلَ الزُّورِ وَالْإِثْمُ وَالْعَمَلُ بِهِ فَلَيْسَ لِلَّهِ حَاجَةً أَنْ يَدْعَ طَعَامَهُ وَشَرَهُ Whoever isn't going to leave the sinful actions and actually be closer to Allah in the month of Ramadan, Allah doesn't need you to leave your food and drink. Al-Iman is what propels the action, the action that will actually benefit us. But anyways, one day, and Umar is the one who reports this hadith, radiallahu anh. He says, one day the Messenger, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, ordered us to give. To give sadaq. And Umar, radiallahu anh, he says, and it just so happened to be at a time that I had come across some wealth or some money. Right? Uh, what's that mean? 
Uh, what's that mean that it just so happened to be one of those times I had some money? They weren't in the business of just accumulating, huh? just stashing away, stashing away. When they used to get money, if they didn't need it to spend on themselves, on their families, sadaqa, right away, right away. What good is money in a bank account when you're six feet under? What good is money in a bank account as we see in other parts of the world that just with one executive order could cause all that money to be worthless? What I'm wearing could be worth a hundred of your money. They used to get money, spend what they need and give the rest for the sake of Allah. But anyways, that's not the point. He said, so I had come across some money. So I wanted to use it as an opportunity to beat who? Abu Bakr. Right? They used to be very competitive in al akhirah with one another. Many ahadith talk about their competitiveness. So Umar said, I got some money and the Messenger وسلم, is ordering us to give. So I was excited because this would be a time for me to beat Abu Bakr. So he goes and he brings half of what he had to the Messenger And he said, here is half. So the Prophet والسلام, asked him, what did you leave for your family? He says, I left them the same. Meaning, I left them the other half. So he said, okay. So who walks in? Abu Bakr. He comes with his stockpile. So he says, I have given everything I have. So the Messenger وسلم, asked him, what did you leave your family? He said, I left them Allah and His Messenger. The one who reports this hadith, Umar, he said, after that, I stopped competing with Abu Bakr. <laughs> there is no point. There's levels to this. But the point is, when your iman is solidified, you won't even hesitate to give all. Maybe we will still, right? But the true iman will propel you to action. Will propel you to action. This is what we're missing from our lives. This is what our children need. And for us adults, perhaps we won't see that change in our lifetime. But your mission in life, along with everything else you've been doing, along with the da'wah, along with learning, along with everything you've been doing for the deen, your mission in life from here on out should be to put your kids in a position better than you were put to raise your children. To put your children in a position to raise their children in a better position than you were placed by your parents. And when they grow up, they do the same for their children. And then after a few generations of Iman properly installed in the hearts, then we will deserve some sort of victory. Then we will deserve some change. But right now, my beloved brothers and sisters in Islam, we have a lot of work to do. And this should encourage us. It shouldn't put us down. And that's not the purpose of this khutbah. The purpose of this khutbah is to encourage us to start, to start. Let's consider up until now a lot of our work has been misguided. A lot of our efforts have been missing a key component which is Al-Iman. And from here on out that's what our focus needs to be. And before we have the Shaykh lead us in the prayer, I have been asked to remind you slash encourage you about an opportunity for one of the organizations which you all are familiar with, Amana. And from my understanding, they are completely non-profit. And on top of that, they do a huge service by providing da'wah material. Right? A lot of us, whether that's due to lack of knowledge or lack of time or lack of ability, we're not able to contribute in the da'wah. But... This is one of those easy opportunities for you to be involved in the da'wah that's actually always giving, right? Sadaq al jari So they have a big shipment of Qur'an and other da'wah material coming. And as you know, they do a lot of their work during Ramadan when people are aware and people are interested. And anything you can give, whether it's a dollar, you will find it on the Day of Judgment. 
and the beauty of our deen and